Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me as part of the keynote lineup in this year's very first ApacheCon Asia 2021. I'm very excited to be here to talk to you virtually, at least, about how to support the next 50 million open source developers that will be popping up from around the world. A quick self-introduction, my name is Kevin Xu. I am currently the Senior Director for International Expansion Strategy at GitHub. I have also worked with many open source startups and companies, particularly in China. So it's very fun and cool to be part of this keynote lineup among many good friends of mine as well. And I can't wait to dive into this very important topic, not just for our industry, but for me personally. How do we support the next 50 million developers? There will be a lot of opportunities, but there will also be a lot of challenges that we need to face. So we need to talk about both of those things. And that will be the focus of my presentation today. Here is some numbers that we have put together on GitHub since GitHub was created in 2008. As you can see, in the previous 12 years of GitHub, we have seen 50 million or so developers working on GitHub as a platform, primarily to work on open source projects. But based on our own projection, in the next five years, really four years at this point, this number will double to 100 million developers in totality from around the world. So we know more or less that there will be at least 50 million developers that will be doing all kinds of creative things on GitHub in the next four to five years or so. And we need to think about a way to support them to make sure they are successful. But before we do that, let's actually dig into where we think they are going to be coming from, this next 50 million developers. What we know for sure is that they will not be coming from the United States, which is currently still the core market for a lot of open source creation and certainly for GitHub. Every time we see new developers, in fact, they are coming from outside of the United States. More than 80% of new developers coming to GitHub, signing up on GitHub, are coming from outside of the United States. So open source is really a growing opportunity, a global opportunity. A lot of that opportunity will be coming from Asia. Some of you may have seen this map before. GitHub published this in the 2020 Octoverse report, where we looked at in 2015, where are the open source contribution coming from from around the world. As you can see, back then, six years ago, this was still very much a United States-centric thing with significant contribution from Western European countries as well, where most of the world at that time, their open source contribution is just not that much. But in just the last five years or so, we're seeing that landscape shift dramatically. In 2015, the top three open source contribution countries were the United States, Germany, and the United Kingdom. The percentages that you see here are the relative proportion of contribution in relation to the entire pie of open source contribution globally. In a mere five years, that picture has changed quite dramatically. The United States is still the most, uh, I would say, prolific open source contribution country at 22%, but that proportion has certainly decreased uh, from 30 to 22. In comes China, which is now the world's second largest contributor to open source at close to 10%, followed by India, while Germany and UK are no longer in the top three picture. But let's look ahead. In the next, say, nine years or 10 years, by 2030, what will the world's open source contribution look like? This is a map that, again, GitHub has put together. Based on our own internal data, we are projecting where will the world's open source contribution be coming from. As you can see, uh, the world will be lighting up with contribution from many, many places, not just the United States, certainly not just in Europe anymore, but a lot of China, a lot of India, a lot of Brazil, a lot of Russia and many other parts of the world, particularly in 
the Asia Pacific region. And this is a very important trend that we will dive into a little bit more today. So let's talk about what this means in terms of opportunity for all of you who are working every single day to bring more open source into Asia via the Apache Foundation. Let's first talk about India. We've done a lot of investments and work in India, and we've seen incredible progress just over the last year or so. These numbers that you're seeing on the screen uh, are progress that we've seen just in the last year. We've added almost 2 million new developers in India alone. One of my favorite, I think, metric on this slide is the 80% increase in open source contributors. As all of you know, open source can only work for the long term if people contribute back, right? You can't just use open source for free forever. Uh, you have to give back to the community, give back to the ecosystem at some point, even though most countries or most companies, most developers, they start out using open source as a free, easy way to learn and use certain technologies or to solve certain problems. That's all fine, but eventually contribution must happen. And it's very important that India as a huge developer market is increasing their open source contribution, which we are seeing just in the last year of investment there alone. And we will be seeing more of that in the future. Lastly, I want to highlight this 1 million number that's near the bottom of the picture, which is a measurement of developers who are creating their first repo. These are Indian developers who uh, created basically their very first project on GitHub. So they're not just contributing to other people's code or to use other people's code. They are starting to make their own, which is incredible. What I like to talk about as well is not just these kind of macro metrics, but also to put a face to open source. Uh, everybody here knows that open source, if you want to be successful in open source, is not just about the code. It's not just about the technology that you're creating. It is about the people on your team, in your project, but also your community members that's going to make this successful. That's a very unique aspect to open source that a lot of people who don't understand open source do not actually appreciate. And I want to highlight the story here of Ashika Mizra. Uh, who is uh, being profiled on the GitHub README project. For some of you may know this, GitHub has a README project where we highlight and really talk about the story, the human story behind some of the developers and the maintainers that are keeping open source alive and healthy around the world. And Shika's story is one of those stories. She is, of course, from India. She is one of the core maintainers of the Magento project, which is a hugely popular open source e-commerce platform built using PHP and her contribution and story is really a good example of the rise of open source developers in India. In fact, Shika said it's a new era in India where open source is popular because it allows everyone to build on everyone else's work. It's the best thing for developers. They can enhance their skills and be properly recognized for their contributions to the community. And I want to highlight here real quick just how everyone is uh, understanding the dynamic that you need to build on everyone else's work so you're not recreating the wheel, but you're also learning through that process and contributing back so eventually someone else can build on top of your work. That is a healthy positive loop, a healthy feedback system, a healthy cycle that will keep open source alive and useful for many years to come. And that is really the way that we can support the next 50 million new developers from coming online. Other parts of APAC is also growing based on what we're seeing. I won't be able to get into the specific numbers, but I do want to highlight some of the growth areas in terms of open source in APAC. Countries like Japan, like South Korea, have been contributing more and more to open source and more and more developers there, especially younger developers, are picking up their technology skills with learning via open source. And Southeast Asia as a region is also seeing a lot of growth in their developer numbers. Singapore, Malaysia, a lot of growth in Indonesia, the Philippines, 
Vietnam and Thailand. These are all dynamic tech regions that uh, a lot of people may not be thinking about when it comes to open source contribution first, but these countries are growing massively and APAC is probably one of the most prominent sources of growth for open source and that will be happening for years to come. And of course, we're going to talk about China. And this, you know, I think a lot of audience, people in the audience here are from the Chinese open source ecosystem. So I don't want to repeat a lot of things that you already know. Everybody probably knows that China is the second largest developer market. I've already shared some statistics earlier in my slide that shows China being the second largest open source contributor globally right after the United States. So it is already a very prominent and important and influential part of the global open source ecosystem. But I still do want to put a face to the story. And many of you here are very familiar with the story of Vilia Zhang. She is from Shanghai. She is the uh, one of the core maintainers of the Apache eChart project. In fact, I believe she is organizing one of the tracks uh, at ApacheCon this year. Uh, eChart is wildly successful, very popular, uh, widely used in honestly all corners of the world. It was originally of open source from Baidu. And her story really epitomizes, again, the rise of China's contribution to open source. And I love sharing this quote from Avilia, which is that when you're in the world of open source, you quickly learn how impactful your work can be. What you think only affects you might actually affect or help an entire community. We have the power to change things for the better with every line of code, comment, and pull request. And this is a very optimistic, forward-looking way of thinking about open source. But I think I also want everyone to think about the word impact here which is that every time you write something in your open source project, whether it's coming from China, India, or somewhere else, they could very much affect people on the other side of the globe, whether you know it or not. So that contribution, the value of that contribution is so much more than that line of code. It is incredibly important for us to understand the network effect of open source contribution, which is very unique and certainly does not happen in a closed source, proprietary software development setting. I want to then talk about this graph for a little bit, because this is painting perhaps a little bit of a different picture than what I've been talking about uh, so far, especially with regard to China. Uh, this is a graph that we put together with our own data that uh, illustrates what we call the contribution to consumption ratio. Consumption means the amount of open source technology that you're using or you're consuming for free. And contribution, of course, we all know, is the amount of code or changes or commits that you're giving back to open source. And we pulled together this ratio for the G20 countries. So this is all the G20 countries and their contribution to consumption ratio. Now the G20 country average is 42%. And what that means is for every two things that you consume from the open source world, you contribute roughly one thing back. Right? That will be a 2 to 1 ratio, which will give you 50%. So the average is 42%, which is a little bit lower than 1 to 2. But that's how I want to illustrate this number so you understand what this ratio really means. And as you can see from what we've discovered, China, despite its contribution that we've talked about so far, is still the lowest among all the G20 country when it comes to this contribution to consumption ratio at around 27%, which you can roughly think about as a one to four ratio, meaning every four things that you're consuming or using uh, from open source, you're only contributing one thing back to that open source. So even though China has been contributing a lot to open source already, it's still consuming way more compared to other G20 countries. And 
I certainly hope personally that China will be contributing more and more. So this percentage goes up, right? There's so much creativity, so much ingenuity, so much new technology that Chinese developers are creating every day, whether they're working at big tech companies uh, or they're creating their own startups or in their universities. And they should contribute even more because their creativity is much needed for the entire open source ecosystem to stay alive and healthy for years to come. And I'm very certain that the next 50 million developers will be using a lot of China created open source technology if that technology is being open source and contributed back to the world. With that setting in mind, let's talk about some of the challenges because contributing is fine, opening up a repo on GitHub is pretty easy to do, but that's you know not the hard part. The hard part is what happens after that. And I wanna talk about three broad challenges that I'm seeing that I hope I can bring to your attention so we can work on this together to make sure we're supporting the next 50 million developers from around the world the right way. The first one is just a global community. What's really interesting that I'm seeing is that as open source becomes more of the default for people to learn and solve technology problems, the more it becomes global, every project basically is a global project from day zero. Doesn't matter how small or how young the project is. The users are gonna come to you if you do the right thing, if you're solving an important problem, if you're open sourcing it, of course you have to tell people about it, you know, on Twitter or WeChat or trending on GitHub. But once a lot of these things are happening, people are gonna be coming to you from around the world. So it's not like you can have a very step-by-step -step plan to expand globally for your project. You know, we start from China first, then maybe we go to Singapore, then we go to India or Japan, and then to the United States. That is not how it's gonna happen. The global attention will come to you whether you're ready or not. So we need to be more ready earlier in the life cycle of new open source projects because you have to answer the question very early can you handle them? Can you handle the global community, the global attention, the users that are coming to you from around the world? Related to that challenge is transparent governance. I think Apache projects do an extremely good job of that. I've worked with a lot of Apache projects. The way you think about and do maintainer election and decision making and roadmap and bring in new committers to become contributors, the process is very transparent and is very respected. So that's something that I think is worth emphasizing because a lot of developers coming from around the world, like I talked about, they wanna learn, they wanna help, but they need to know how to help. And the way they do that is not just to understand how your code works, but also to understand how your governance work within a project. And the more transparent that project is, just like the transparency of your code base, the better that is, because that creates more trust, more transparency, and more access to open source for these new 50 million developers that will be coming online and they want to help. And the best part of transparent governance and open source is that you can then keep these contributors from coming back for years and years to come. It's very common to see a poor uh, governance process, whether it's how you deal with contribution or how do you merge your PR or how do you become a maintainer, all these uh, processes being very opaque or very confusing. Even if your project is very exciting as a technology, people will lose interest and go to other projects that are better governed. So I cannot emphasize enough the challenge of having transparent governance uh, from day zero in order to keep a lot of these developers uh, so they are coming back to help build your project. The last challenge I want to talk about, and this is quite personal to me because I, I think writing, technical writing is a very important but often overlooked part of open source management and so is localization. Uh, all of you open source veterans would know these uh, developers, 
they come to your projects passively first, right? They find you on Google, they find you on GitHub, they find you on Hacker News, and they'll just be in the background reading, you know, trying, and then secretly using your project for their own pet project or maybe even inside their companies. And it takes a very long time for you to even find out. But you want that to happen. And the best way for that to happen is not just your code base being well designed or well architected or well commented, but the documentation has to be extremely well structured so people can access this passively in a very easy way. And as we talk about how the global attention will be coming to you from day one, you're gonna have to localize it probably to some extent too. And localize in this sense uh, mostly means uh, local language, but there could certainly be other cultural aspects where you have to localize the way you run your community in different parts of the world, the way you run your open source community meetup in say Brazil, or Israel or Japan will be a little bit different perhaps than from China or India or certainly the United States. But really, I think the most important part is how do you localize documentation, which is frankly the first thing probably that any new developer will read when they find your project. And if they can't read it, they're not going to try. And you're losing precious users precious contributors uh, that could really make a big difference for the future of your project. The last thing I want to highlight, well, the second last thing I want to highlight is this. I read this recently from a website called restofworld.org, which is a very wonderful website that looks at technology from outside Silicon Valley. You know, we pay so much attention to Silicon Valley all the time, but really, as we see from open source contribution, creation and developers and new technologies will be built from other parts of the world, not just in Silicon Valley. And very recently, Rest of the World highlighted six tech hubs that are promising, that are growing outside of Silicon Valley. And what I want to highlight here is just how diverse these tech hubs are popping up from around the world. Some of these you might have heard of already, Bangalore in India, Shenzhen of course in China. These have been leading tech hubs in their own flavor for probably many years now. But we're also seeing a lot of tech growth in Lagos of Nigeria, Recife in Brazil, Tel Aviv in Israel, and Medellin in Colombia. Now, this is not uh, talking about open source per se, right? These are tech hubs that are making all kinds of different companies and products. But chances are these tech hubs, the startups that are coming from these tech hubs will be using open source. And the kind of open source technology that they're going to be using will likely come from Asia, from China, from Japan, from India. So it's a very exciting next four to five years to see how the next 50 million developers coming from Lagos and Medellin create their next version of a Silicon Valley startup and how open source from Asia could contribute to their success. So that is the level of power, the level of opportunity, but also the level of challenges and responsibility that I hope all of us feel as we head into the next four to five years to work together. Now, this is the last thing I want to share with you, which is the story of Salah al Dafari. He is also one of the profiles that we've highlighted on the GitHub README project. What is so incredibly inspiring about Salah's story is that he is a young, new developer from Yemen, one of the next 50 million developers. He learned how to code using open source in an internet cafe. Because in Yemen, internet access is not guaranteed. In fact, electricity is not even guaranteed. There's still a civil war there, and he has been learning nonstop as much as he could during both war and the COVID-19 pandemic. And he is now a founder of his own startup called Tectonic Labs. What he shared in his profile is that in 2020, which was a difficult year for everybody, in Yemen, the major pipelines that bring high-speed internet to Yemen were attacked three times, taking down 60% of the entire internet of the country. 
So learning how to code with no clear educational options like schools or code camps or amidst war and without consistent internet access has been really rough, but it was more than worth it because now Salah has his own tech company that he can build because of the skills that he has learned from open source despite this incredibly challenging environment that he is in. So I wanna keep this story in mind for myself and for everybody who works in open source, is that you're not just serving the big tech companies, you're not just serving your customers, your users from developed countries like the US or Japan and in China and India as well, you're also serving people like Salah, whose only way out is to learn about technology through trying circumstances that he cannot change in his own country. But even with limited internet access, even with just a few hours every day, he can learn to code. And it's our responsibility to make that as easy and pleasant and useful for Salah and other people like Salah as possible. And that is the mission that we have in the next four to five years to serve the next 50 million developers that will be coming online from around the world. Thank you again for having me at ApacheCon Asia this year. If you have any questions or you want to interact with me, feel free to interact with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And I look forward to hearing from you and hope you all have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you.